Hey, John here at the Grape and Granary, and today I'm going to be doing a video on how to make beer from my malt extract beer kit. And particularly, we're going to be making a Grape and Granary American Pale Ale. So before we get into the actual nuts and bolts of how to brew, there's a couple things I want to go over with you first. Um, first of all, I've been a brewer so for over 20 years now. I'm a um, nationally recognized beer judge in the Beer Judge Certification Program. Uh, I've been brewing beer for probably 25 years, so I'm pretty knowledgeable about the topic. Um, and I, there's a couple things I really need to go over with you first before we actually get started with the brewing. And um, those are the four pitfalls to home brewing, what I call the four pitfalls to home brewing. First thing is going to be water. Uh, you need to be very careful with the water that you choose for beer brewing. One of the most common mistakes we see people uh, make on a daily basis is brewing a batch of beer with chlorinated city water. When you brew beer, with chlorinated water, it's the, probably the easiest way to ruin a batch of beer, and your beer will come out tasting with a really harsh, sharp, uh, bitter edge to it. So you want to make sure that the water that you brew with has no chlorine. So number one, you can start out with city water if you like. City water is generally chlorinated to keep things from growing in it, but if you were to take that water and run it through a charcoal filter, that would take care of the chlorine. I like to use one of the, the types that uh, push the water through the charcoal filters, the cylinders under the sink but you could also use like a Brita uh, filter pitcher. Um, you could also add a Camden tablet to the water you're gonna brew with. One crushed Camden tablet that winemakers use will uh, neutralize the chlorine in about 20 gallons of brewing water. So if you crush up a tablet, stir it up into your brewing water, that will eliminate the chlorine as well. Three, you can always bottle your water, I'm sorry, buy your water if you like, rather than uh, using your own water. Uh, generally, bottled water does not contain chlorine. And four, you can boil the water for, uh, I don't know, four or five minutes. That'll drive the chlorine gas out of the water, then it's okay and safe for brewing. Uh, no matter which one of these methods you want to do, you want to make sure there's no chlorine in the water when you start. So that's number one. Number two, you want to start with a good recipe, and that's going to be something that we're going to sell you. Any of the box kits that we have are going, is going to be a good recipe. What you really have to watch out for, we see this a lot on the internet, is recipes that call for a small amount of sugar and a large amount, I'm sorry, a large amount of sugar and a small amount of malt extract. Anytime you have about more than 20% of the total weight of your malt extract or your, or your malts, your, your ingredients being uh, sugar, you're going to end up with a really cidery, uh, winey taste in your beer. It's what we call prohibition beer, so you don't want to do that. Commercial breweries do not add a lot of sugar at all to their recipe. Some don't use any sugars at all. It's not that you have to add sugar to get um, alcohol. There's plenty of alcohol that will come from the malt extract itself. You don't need to add refined sugar. So that's two things. Third thing you need to watch out for is going to be sanitation. And I always like to recommend an iodine-based sanitizer or a powdered sanitizer, something like the Easy Clean or the One Step. Those are good sanitizers. But before you can sanitize something, you always want to remember it has to be clean first. So visually, you want to look at the thing that you're sanitizing, make sure it looks clean, then you can hit it with a sanitizer, something like Iota 4 or Bright or Seabright. And the last thing that you want to be really careful about is your yeast strain. You want to make sure that the yeast you're using is fresh, it's not out of date. Um, ideally, you want to use a high quality yeast, whether that be liquid or dry. Personally, I tend to lean more toward the liquid yeast, but there's a lot of good dry yeast out there these days. What I would really avoid is any uh, can that says stout on it or porter or pale ale or whatever, and there's a little, when you lift up the cap, there's a little pack of dry yeast under there. Don't use that yeast. You're better off throwing that in the trash, getting yourself a nice pack of dry, a yeast that's been in the refrigerator, uh, something like a Fermentis brand yeast is, is what we recommend generally. Um, also, a Nottingham is another good uh, quality dry yeast, uh, but avoid the yeast that come on the tops of the cans. So if you do these four things, you watch out for your sanitation issues, your yeast, your recipe, and your water, you've got the recipe there for a good quality beer. So let's go on now. We'll talk about some of the ingredients that we're going to use in the recipe, and then we'll get down to actually brewing the batch of beer. So I want to go ahead then and spend a few minutes showing you uh, what the ingredients uh, are going to be in the uh, actual kit itself uh, so you can get kind of a, an idea of well, what to get used to. First of all, we've got three pounds of dried malt extract in this particular kit. We've got 3.3 pounds of uh, light malt syrup. We've got our specialty grains. And in this particular case, since we're making an American uh, pale ale, these grains are going to give us the color and the flavor to match an American pale ale. So for example, if we wanted that orange color that Sierra Nevada pale ale uh, has, we're going to get that from the crystal malt and a little bit of chocolate malt uh, that is in this bag. Also a little bit of a toasty character from some Munich malt that's in here. So these grains will give us those colors, flavors, and aroma that we're looking for in American pale ale. 
Then in a separate bag, we're going to have our instruction sheet, which walks you through the entire process step by step. And that will be included in every kit. On the back, you'll also find there's some um, examples of commercial beer styles that fall into this category of American Pale Ale. You're going to have a pack of priming sugar. This is what you'll put into the beer right before you bottle. This is what creates the second fermentation in the bottle and carbonates the beer. You'll have a roll flock tablet. This helps the beer to clear during the boil. One pack of dry yeast. A steeping sock, and this is going to be for steeping the grains, which you'll see here in a minute. And finally, um, our hops. And in this particular kit, there are three different hop additions. So we're going to be doing a 45 minute boil. One package, the one called Bittering Hops, is going to go in at the beginning of the 45 minutes. We've got one package labeled Flavor Hops. These will go in 15 minutes before the end of the 45 minute boil. And then finally, we have our Aroma Hops. These will go in the last two to five minutes of the boil. All right, to start out, I've put approximately one gallon of water into our stock pot. This water has been run through a charcoal filter, so there's no chlorine in the water. I've brought the water up to 160 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're just going to go ahead then and take our specialty grains, which came with our kit, and we're going to put those in our little steeping sock, and we're going to steep these grains in the water for approximately 20 minutes. And again, our heat is off, and we're just steeping the grain gently, like making a tea, to extract the color, the aroma, and the flavor. After about 10 minutes or so, we can go ahead and take a sample out to see what kind of uh, color we're getting. And you can see we've got a pretty good amber color. This is kind of what we're shooting for for this style. All right, it's been 20 minutes of steeping, and we're going to go ahead and remove our grains now, and we're going to go ahead then and add some water, and we're going to bring that to a boil. Okay, we've completed our 20-minute steep. We're now going to add some dechlorinated water, bring our volume in our stock pot up to about four gallons, and then we're going to turn on the heat. Okay, we've just about brought our four gallons of liquid to a boil now, so we're going to go ahead and add our malt syrup. And you want to make sure you stir this really well because we do not want it to scorch on the bottom of the uh, boiling kettle. Next, we're going to add our three pounds of dry malt extract. We're going to pour that in, and again, we want to stir it well so it doesn't scorch on the bottom of the kettle. And next, we're going to add the packet of hops labeled bittering hops directly to the kettle. And we're going to bring this back up to a boil, and we're going to let it boil for 45 minutes. While we're bringing this back up to a boil, we want to be very careful that we don't have a boil over, so we're going to want to monitor it very closely as we're bringing this back up to a boil, and we want to cut the heat back if it starts to foam too much. Once we get this back up to a rolling boil and we've turned the heat down, it'll start to regulate itself, and then we can regulate the heat, and we want a nice, vigorous rolling boil without it foaming out of the kettle. You can see it's just coming to a boil now, and this is when we really want to keep an eye on it, make sure we don't have a boil over. I'm going to go ahead and adjust the heat, turn the flame down a little bit. We want to have a nice, vigorous boil like you're seeing here, but we don't want it to foam out of the stock pot. Okay, we're at uh, 15 minutes before the end of our 45 minute boil, so at this point in time we're going to go ahead and add the flavoring hops, which we're going to pour directly into the kettle. We're going to add our Royal Flock or Irish Moss tablet directly into the kettle. And finally, I'm going to go ahead and throw our wort chiller in there. That's going to sanitize the wort chiller. Uh, you don't have to have a wort chiller, but it does uh, save quite a bit of time. So we'll put the lid back on. We're going to give this another 15 minutes. And at that, that time, we'll go ahead and add our aroma hops and we'll finish this patch up. All right, we're at two minutes before the end of the 45 minute boil. So we're going to add our aroma hops, we're going to boil two more minutes, then we'll turn the cold water for, from the tap on to circulate cold water through our wort chiller, cool the batch of beer down to around uh, 70, 80 degrees, and then we'll transfer it to our fermenter, top it up to five gallons uh, with our cold dechlorinated water, and we'll be ready to add our yeast. We're going to go ahead now and 
top it up with some uh, bottled just chilled water and we're going to bring our volume up to five gallons. So I've previously incubated my liquid Y yeast. You can see how much that's swollen. Go ahead and tear that open and we're going to go ahead and pour the yeast in. And then once you've added the yeast, you really want to go ahead and stir this up well. So I've sanitized my racking can and I'm just going to use this to stir it up well. They want to kind of aerate the wort and get a bunch of air in there. That'll help the beer start fermenting more quickly. Now once it's aerated well, stirred up well, we're going to go ahead, put our lid on, snap it down all the way around our ferment. We've taken our airlock and I've filled it halfway with water and we'll attach the little lid and then this will go right into the stopper and the lid and we'll let it go. This will need to ferment in this fermenter for probably about three to five days. Um, in about a day or so, you should see some activity in the airlock. The little bubbler there will start to um, bubble up and down quite quickly for a good two, three, four days. It'll slow down to the point where maybe it's only bubbling once a minute. At that point, it's pretty much done. We'll then be ready to transfer this into our secondary container or our carboy, where we'll let the beer settle for another three to five days to let it clear before we're ready to bottle. So now we're here on day four. The beer is finished fermenting. We're ready to transfer the beer from our first or primary fermenter over to our clarifying tank which we call our secondary fermenter and to do that I'm going to use an auto siphon although you could just use your standard siphon so we're going to go ahead, and this has all been sanitized by the way place our racking tube down inside of the, our American Pale Ale take the other end of the hose, put it down into our collecting container which is our five gallon uh, carboy we're going to give this a couple of quick pumps to start the siphon and you can see the liquid is siphoning right over to our secondary. And we'll want to kind of keep the tip of the racking tube up a little bit off the bottom. We don't want to start sucking up a bunch of heavy sediment. Uh, and you can see really after just four days of fermentation, this beer is already uh, pretty clear. Every beer is going to be a little bit different. If the beer wasn't clearing very well, you could always add a, a clarifier. I generally like to use an icing glass or a um, gelatin finding if you need to, but the majority of the time the beer is going to clear uh, on its own without any assistance. All right, now that we've racked the beer into our secondary fermenter, I'm going to go ahead and attach an airlock and a stopper. Again, the airlock is halfway filled with water. And you want to always protect your beer from light. Uh, direct sunlight, especially striking the beer, will skunk the beer. So I always keep my carboys covered while the beer is clarifying. And the beer will now sit in here for about three to five more days. In three to five days, we'll go ahead and siphon off of that sediment, put it into a bottling container, and then we'll bottle. Okay, here we are on day eight. I want you to take a look at our beer. You can see how well it's cleared out. And then you can see also a fairly significant amount of sediment on the bottom of the carboy here. So let's get a shot of that. You can see the sediment we have just there, maybe a quarter of an inch thick there all the way at the bottom. So what we we'll want to do now is we'll siphon off of this sediment into a bottling container. Leaving the sediment behind, we'll add our priming sugar. And then we'll go ahead and start to bottle. All right, here we are on bottling day, and again, this is day eight. We've gone ahead and racked our beer into our bottling container, leaving the sediment behind. So we've got five gallons of nice clear beer in our bottling container. Uh, we've added our five ounces of priming sugar, which comes with the kit. We stirred that in really well, made sure that sugar was evenly dispersed and dissolved throughout the entire batch. And now we're ready to go ahead and start filling our bottles. A couple ways you can do this. Uh, one would be to use a uh, spring loaded bottle filler like this, and when you can see what you can do with a bottle filler, um, it's spring-loaded, so as we press down into the bottom of our bottle with the bottle filler, the bottle will fill. When we let go, it will shut off. So that way we're able to go from bottle to bottle, filling each bottle without making a big mess. So what I'm going to do, put this into our bottle, and I'm going to press down to the bottom of the bottle. The liquid will then flow over from the bucket into the bottle. When we get to the very top of the bottle, we'll let up on the pressure, which shuts off the flow, leaving just about the right amount of headspace in the bottle. And then we can go over to the next bottle. Once we have all the bottles filled, we're ready to go ahead and cap them. Um, the cappers are magnetized, so we can take our crown cap, place it underneath our capper, and the cap will stay in place. Place that on top of our beer bottle, press the two handles down, release the handles, and there you are. It's well capped, and now the idea is just to store it someplace between 60 and 70 degrees. You want it to be fairly warm so that we allow that natural carbonation process to take place. 
The beer will then carbonate in the next one or two weeks, and then before we drink them, of course, we're going to want to go ahead and chill them, give them a, and maybe at least a couple hours in the refrigerator before you crack one open. All right, here we are uh, two weeks after bottling date. Our bottles, our beers had plenty of time to sit and mature. It's carbonated and I've chilled it, so we're going to go ahead and crack one open, see how we did. When you pour a beer of naturally carbonated homebrew, it's going to have a little bit of sediment on the bottom, so what you want to do is kind of gently pour the beer into a glass like this, keep pouring and pouring until you get to the very bottom, and then stop pouring, and then you'll be able to leave the yeast sediment in the bottom of the bottle, but you'll have a nice, clear glass of beer. So, cheers. Call us if you have any problems or any questions. We're always here to uh, take your questions. Uh, John at the Grape and Granary, www.thegrape.net. Thanks for watching.